Hey guys, we're talking Dr. Umar Johnson. So this video may be a little controversy. I promise you, this is not what I am intending, but I can't take it anymore. I just saw an interview with The Breakfast Club with Dr. Umar Johnson. And for a while, he was, he was changing my view of him. Not that it's a bad view of him, but it was just like, okay, maybe I was a little hard on him, but nah, we got to talk about it. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who do not know me, I am Cindy Lumpkin. I am the educator who quit almost eight years ago. I started my own school. I show other teachers who are interested in doing the same thing, how to do that. I am also a special education teacher and I talk all things special education. So if you're interested in any of that, make sure you click that button and follow me. Listen, today we are going to talk about Dr. Uma Johnson. All right. In my head, I've always kind of had this love-hate relationship with the man. Okay. Maybe I should take off the hate because I don't hate him. And it's not as bad as it, it sounds now, but I also know that some people might find this controversy and I'm not trying to be that. I really just want at the end of the day, the work that I do is at the grassroots level, down on the ground. I see the people, right? And we have to be responsible for the things that come out of our mouth and how they come out. Okay, so Dr. Umar Johnson was on The Breakfast Club again. He passes through there every so often. And one of my Facebook friends actually referenced the interview because I'm not necessarily a follower of the, of the Breakfast Club. I do occasionally listen in when there is an interview that sparks my interest. But my friend was like, hmm, Dr. Umar Johnson is kind of eccentric, but the man is he's kind of smart. He's brilliant. And I wrote, yeah, he really is. There's a lot of things, a truth to what he says. It comes off kind of hard. And... Some of it, I just don't agree with him, especially when it comes to special education. So anyway, I decide today to listen to The Breakfast Club. And as always, Dr. Johnson is dropping some, some good stuff. Like, once again, he is eccentric, maybe. I don't know. And Like, no disrespect. The man is smart. And I, I really do admire some of the things that he says. Now, it is not the way that I choose to use my passion to do the work that we do. Um, I guess I kind of feel like our careers kind of, I don't want to say intertwine, but he's a psychologist. I took several um, psychology courses, even as a special education teacher. So now I'm not as brilliant as him, okay? I'm not saying that whatsoever. And that is not coming from a place of low self-esteem, all right? But I am just as passionate about working with kids with special needs, right? And pretty much everything in the interview, I mean, for the most part, I'm like, okay, okay. He said some things that, you know, that I was glad he clarified because he is very pro-black, but he was like, my pro-blackness does not mean, you know, I don't like other racial groups, but he don't agree with you know, black people and white people, England, me, or probably any other culture, right? But anyway, he was like, okay, don't paint me as this person that hates. I'm like, okay, I'm glad about that, all right? But this is what he said that got me all up in arms. Parents, stop getting your children tested for special ed. Okay. This is the part that really bugs me about him. Now, I will be the first to raise my hand and say that there are issues <laughs> with special education. There's lots of issues with special education. I just think it was a very careless message to just kind of drop at the end of this hour long interview because you do not know who's watching that and who is gonna literally take your words. And he literally said, don't put your child in special ed. And once again, I'm not trying to advocate kids going in special education, but to say that is such educational male practice and not have anything to come before that and have anything to come after that. I am sure if he was to sit down and explain to you why he believes that, then it will make some sense. Even though I don't agree with that, 
Um, and I, I think it is, I think we also have to realize that there are two, two things can be true at the same time. There are kids who learn differently, who need something differently. And the way that they get that is through special education. Then special education can be awful. <laughs> and it does not always live up to its hope with achieving the goals that it intends to with children, right? It is better, at least for some parents, not everybody can protect their child from a label, right? And that's the sad part. But once again, even when we're talking about labels, that's all we do in society. We label everything, right? That is black, white. I'm from, you're an American, you're Canadian. I mean, that's what we do. Does that make it right? No. However, I think my issue with Dr. Johnson, when he says this, it's not easy to be dealing with a child who has ADHD all the way up here. <laughs> I have been that teacher. And once again, I'm not someone who is the first to advocate medication. But when you're telling parents to not get their children help for issues, that are real. People try to say ADHD is this made up thing. Okay, I it, it, it could be made up, but that doesn't change the fact that your child who's bouncing off the wall, it looks like it's real, right? And we don't see that. And parents, some parents, a lot of parents, well-meaning parents often, okay, this is, I read some research on this. When parents or when a, a, a parent's child is diagnosed with having some type of learning issue, uh, research has said that it is almost like grieving the loss of someone that has passed and that parents often go through different stages of the grief cycle and they can blame, they can be in denial, they can be angry, they can be fearful, they can feel guilty and shame. They can even do bargaining. And just like with grief, that there, there's no set timetable, different parents, they can go through these different stages and sometimes they can get over it and then go back through it. Now, why is that important? It is important because especially in the African-American community, we do have this suspicion because we have been treated so poorly. Our kids in some cases have been overrepresented, right? But I don't want to say but because that's a big deal. However, dealing with that is the answer is not to say don't get your child tested because some of your children need the help and they need the help that many parents don't know how to help their own children. They don't have the resources. And that was another thing. Once again, you're saying to this Title I mom who might be working, may not be working, who may have finished high school, who may not have finished high school, you're saying, don't get them tested. Even though there are some issues with your child, don't get them tested. Use Title I funds to go and get your sour tutor. Well, first of all, she has to navigate that. If the school she's in has not made that abundantly clear, she's going to have to figure out how do I use my voice? How do I stand up to this principal and say, hey, I'm entitled to this. I need X, Y, Z, right? And then on top of that, I have been employed by some of these companies that have uh, this um, to be like a partner with the district, right? Some of these companies are awful. So even though your child may get tutoring what is the quality of this tutoring looking like okay and then for that parent who who's like teachers are saying hey ma'am there are some things going on this child is is not reading to grade level you know he can't do xyz and maybe i think there's something more to this or so that parent who be like well you know and Dyslexic children are very bright people, right? You can hardly tell that there's anything wrong unless you ask them to read. And so to the parent who may not see that child in that academic setting all the time, well, he's at home. He's doing X, Y, Z. He's, he's problem solving. He's doing whatever. He has no issues with, you know, other kids or whatever. I don't understand. Ain't nothing wrong with my child. 
That's, that's the number one thing that I hear often. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with your child except that he ain't reading on grade level. And if you don't nip that in the butt soon, he may never get to the point where he's reading on grade level. So I think it's just educational male practice to drop something that heavy at the end of this wonderful interview, discouraging people to get their children help. I just can't tell you guys how many times I've come across parents who as well-meaning as they are, it's like, no, they ain't gonna put my child in them classes. Meanwhile, your child is sitting up in school, not learning to his or her potential, uh, feeling awful because they understand I'm not learning to his or her or not learning to their potential. And if you guys don't know my own story, I was actually in special education um, and it was horrible. I, I, I tell people all the time, Special Ed for me did the job of helping to remediate me to an extent, but my self-esteem plummeted, right? So it's not perfect. But if I had it to do all over again, knowing that it was going to be the same exact same outcome, I would wholeheartedly sign me up, put me in there. As long as I got my Miss Blah, put me right on in there because my parents just come from a working class household. We were called the trail of people. I used to like to make myself feel good. I was like, well, at least we own our land. There was kids that came from the trailer court. <laughs> we owned our trailers. But, oh. <laughs> but anyway, my mom didn't have the money to get me the the title one tutor i don't even I, my school probably wasn't even a title one program right I, we were in the country so um she didn't have that money to get the tutor a matter of fact i think i did have like a retired teacher to help me a little bit here and there but she wasn't doing the science of reading and which we know that's what's needed for kids who who have reading deficits who are dyslexic right so even, you know, it's not the end all. The dyslexia community is still fighting for kids to be educated with the appropriate resources. So it's not, you're not going to solve the problem of these kids who are falling behind by saying, oh, just get a tutor. Because then you have to evaluate, is this tutor being, is this tutor good? Are they using best practices? And if you are a parent who don't know what that looks like or know what questions to ask, then the tutoring itself is not going to help. Like I lied to you guys not. There are parents who are children are in middle school reading on like elementary school level, like third grade, second grade level, and they have no earthly idea. Like it gets to a point and they're like, I I never, he was bringing home A's and B's. Well, yeah, they kind of give everybody grades these days, right? So I don't know. I just, I really feel like it was, it was just such, it was horrible to say that y'all. And so I feel like as parents, you have to arm yourself with information. Yeah, not every child who has deficits deserve to be in special education. They don't, but I promise you, there are a whole lot of kids who need the extra help or if even if you are able to strategically use special education to get help that you may not have to pay for. So, and we're talking about, that is a whole nother level, okay? Because we don't know that these same people who are in these Title I schools don't know how to leverage that stuff. So you're telling them like, don't get this help when they could get this help and then just like you working on a school, there are other teachers now who are starting small schools where those t children could take that special education money and go to. But you are sending a blanketed message that is really going to do more harm to the very people that he's trying to help. And for me, it's frustrating because I've seen several of his <laughs> interviews in which he said things about special education that I didn't necessarily agree with. But once again, I don't want to come out against Dr. Uma Johnson. Like, I mean, once again, I even admit the man, I do think he's brilliant. I do think he has a passion that comes from an innocent place. And although the way he chooses to use that passion it wouldn't, is not the same way 
I choose to, right? Now, we do, we work with the same hue of people. But for me, I just like to say I'm, I work at the grassroots and I work with any underserved child or young adult who needs my help. So you can be white, black, Chinese, Asian, you know, what, whatever that is, okay? And so, um, it ha but it happens to be a lot of black people, right? Why? Because I live in a city that is heavily populated by black people and the community I live in is heavily populated by black people. So inherently, I'm going to be working with a lot of black people, but I don't separate myself. But once again, that's, that's your choice, right? And yet I, I'm so happy that for a long time, people thought he was stealing money because this school that he was dreaming of just had not materialized. And if you guys should be, I would say go back and look at the interview, okay? And even donate to his cause, right? Because once again, I am believing or I think that his heart is in the right place. I think his school, once it is funded, is going to do some amazing things because I, I believe in alternatives to our public education. I get upset with it because I feel like public education will not state the obvious. They just do not have the resources to be able to provide the promise of a quality education for every student. They just don't. And then I don't know when they ever will. Now, do they do some things trying now? But it's such a big system, a big machine that I'm, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have my child there waiting, right? And I think sometimes with even like with people like with Dr. Uma Johnson, you know, you have this huge platform. You may not be Oprah, right? <laughs> it took you uh, for years to, to get to the point where you are now. And my, in my mind, it's like, well, why wait? I may not be able to impact hundreds of kids. I may be able to talk, impact five and tens, right? So that's kind of what I choose to do. I choose not to wait until you guys give me a hundred and three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to buy the best building wherever. I just start where I am, changing the lives of a couple of kids here and there. And then if the good Lord increases that where I can do more like somebody like him, I will. But it is it is really hard because at the end of the day, that's how I have been able to even help the people that I have helped because their parents recognize that they need help. And because of that special education funding, I was able to be there for them with people who wouldn't normally be able to afford the tutors, who wouldn't be able to afford private education. And so just to tell parents, hey, don't get tested. Don't put them in special ed. Are you going to go and take all of these children? No, you can't. I'm not even going to be a hater. If you guys can, donate to his school. Because like I said, I, I believe even though I would never have something that um, is only exclusively for one group, um, I believe all types of schools are needed, right? Kudos to him for endeavoring to be the solution, right? Because they could just be talking about it. But at the same time, man, your platform is too large. You cannot spew all types of stuff because at the end of the day, you can short circuit all the good that you have the potential to do because you're sending messages to people who want to hang on to the hope that ain't nothing wrong with that child. And I ain't saying nothing wrong with that child. But I know I've, I've had a whole bunch of them who butt couldn't sit still. And I know, and I know that they weren't doing it on purpose. So, um, yeah, guys, I guess that's my rant for today. <laughs> that's my contribution to this conversation. Um, I believe in choice now. Like at one point, I didn't want because I believe that, oh, the poor working class people, it's going to hurt them. Listen, when we don't do things the right way, it's going to hurt them anyway. OK, I believe people should have the choice and I rather choose whether or not uh, I get screwed over versus having that choice taken from me. And matter of fact, one of my students just graduated from Fort Valley College. That was never, ever, ever in this child's future. But he was able to do that because there was a triumph. And if there was not a triumph, this kid wouldn't have changed his whole family lineage. And so 
Um, I believe in independent schools. We need them and we have to be careful not just to look at it and say, oh, it's a private school. Um, they have all the money in the world. No. Underserved people, people of color. Nope. Those not our schools are not filled with people who have lots of money. <laughs> It's a, it's a struggle, but it's needed. All right, guys. Um, listen, let me tell you um, some exciting stuff coming up. I will be doing some updating to the article I wrote on how to start your own schools. I have some videos that's going to be dropping. That's going to basically, it's going to be this little curriculum. So if you are truly interested in starting your own school, you are going to be able to get this little curriculum all for free. But make sure you guys are following me. Um, check back. I should be making that announcement real soon so that you'll know exactly how all of this is going to work. Until then, be good. And don't forget to leave. Drop down below what you think. All right. Bye-bye.